Okay, it's good to have everybody back after a coffee break, and we're ready to jump right back in where we left off. That'll be in 1 John chapter 5. And for those of you joining us on television, I just have to take a minute to thank you from the depths of our heart. We just came up with our year-end report, and uh, my, the Lord has been good. We have been so blessed, and uh, we've been taking on more stations and everything. And uh, it's because of you folks who are willing to give. You know, I never ask for a dime. We're not underwritten. People can't understand it. I just had a call a while back. Where do you get money to be on television? Well, God's people. And uh, so it has. It's, it's been a, a real blessing. And the prayers that are also just as necessary as the dollars. And uh, we thank you for those of you here in the studio and for our class people around the state. But uh, for our listening audience, my, it's so thrilling to read your letters. And uh, you're all aware that we like to have you keep them short. But uh, sometimes if you've got a testimony that takes another page, well, you go ahead. We're still going to read them. And uh, Iris and I still are able to open every, every letter. So if it's nothing but the check, we catch the name. And uh, my, some of these names have been coming through every month for years on end, and uh, we do. We just thank the Lord for every one of you. Okay, now like we said uh, at the beginning of the last program, we uh, are teaching these little Jewish epistles from that perspective, that they were written to Jewish believers in view of the horrors of the tribulation just out in front of them. And so these are epistles to encourage them. And the language is almost identical with that of Christ's earthly ministry and the four Gospels in the early book of Acts. That salvation was coming to these Jews by simply believing, plus of course all the rest of the Judaism requirement. But they were to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Period. And as I've said over and over while we've been teaching these, you don't see one word about salvation through the death of burial, and resurrection. It's only believing who Jesus is and was. No mention of the body of Christ. That was an unknown term to these Jewish believers. All right, so now we come into 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10, where we ended our last program. Same kind of language as John's gospel. He that believeth on the Son of God. That's a perfect parallel with John 3.16. For whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. All right, whosoever believeth has the witness in himself. But the other side of the coin, the flip side, he that believeth not, God hath made him the unbeliever a what? I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I knew I'd do it. Let's read it again. He that believeth not, God hath made him, God, a lawyer. Now that's the way that has to be read. He that believeth not God makes God a liar. Now, just stop and think a minute. If I were to tell you something that I know is as truthful as truthful can possibly be, and you turn right around and tell me I don't believe it, what could you just as well call me? A liar. You would just simply say, less you're a liar. Well, that's what every unbeliever is doing with the Almighty God. And God cannot lie. Consequently, it is the one and only sin that will put men and women into the lake of fire. Unbelief. Calling God a liar. Now, there is one primary example that is used all through Scripture to drive home the point of what happens when mankind will not believe God. And it's Kadesh Barnea. All right, when Israel had just received the temple worship in the uh, form of the little tent, and they've now got the priesthood, and they're ready for the promised land. But even before they get out of Egypt, this is what God promises them concerning the future time of going to the promised land. Now, you know, as we've been studying Isaiah in one of our Oklahoma classes, and uh, 
You know, I, I even get to the place myself where I just love to just hammer home some things for my own benefit. Because that's the only way we retain it. See, that's, that's what brainwashers do. They just hammer something home so that it never can slip out again. All right, so I'm hammering home in the book of Isaiah. I've got some of my Tahlequah people here. That all through the book you have the promises of God. But those promises all concern the future. And so then we call it what? Prophecy. Promises and prophecy. All right, here's a good example back here in Exodus now, chapter 23. Exodus 23. Israel is still in Egypt, but the time is coming when they'll be leaving. And when they leave, they're going to be heading for the promised land. That was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob some 400 years earlier. All right, now look what God says to Moses. Exodus chapter 23. Let's start at verse 20. Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I send an angel. Now that's capitalized, so it's the angel of the Lord, which is God the Son. <clears throat> Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have, what? Prepared. God's gotten it already. You know how long he's been working on it? 400 years. That's a long time to get some real estate ready, isn't it? <laughs> now, that's the way I like to look at glory. My goodness, God is working in all eternity to get heaven prepared for you and I. No wonder it's going to be glorious. But all right, here God is telling Moses that they're getting ready to go to the place that he has been preparing for them for the last 400 years. All right, read on. Verse 21, Bepare, uh, Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. That is, the angel of the Lord. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. For my angel, capitalized again, the angel of the Lord, and Jacob puts another definition on it in Genesis 48, I think it is, the angel of the Lord who redeemed me. How many redeemers in Scripture? One. So it has to be the Son of God that is the Redeemer, the angel, all right? And he will go before thee to bring thee to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the tribes living up in the Promised Land. The Hivites and the Jebusites, I will cut them off. In other words, God's going to move them out. Then the voice, the warning, thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them, break down their images, and you shall serve the Lord your God. That is, when they would get into the promised land. Now, don't forget what we're talking about. And, you, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. Now, what are all these? Promises. Right now? No. A little ways out into the future. So then it becomes a what? Prophecy. Promise and prophecy. All right. I will send my fear before thee. Verse 27. I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. I will make all thy enemies turn their backs to thee. Now, you don't fight with your back to the enemy. You're running. Right? All right. So that's where he's got the Canaanite tribes. With their back to the Israelites, they're running. How is he going to get them to run? The next verse. God says, I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. And I'll not drive them out in one year, lest the land become dust. In other words, he's not going to drive them out so fast that before the Jews have time to come in and become settled and start taking over the farmland and the vineyards and the pastures and everything, 
He's going to do it slow enough so that nothing falls out of production. Nothing. The land is just going to remain in production. What a promise. Verse 30. By little and little I will drive them out until thou be increased and inherit the land. What a promise. I've been working 400 years to get this ready. Well, who's been his workmen? The Canaanites. The Canaanites are building, you know, they thought for themselves. No, they weren't building it for themselves. In God's providence, they were getting it ready for the Jews. So it's prophecy. It's a promise, see? Verse 31. I will set thy bounds, or your borders, from the Red Sea even to the Sea of the Philistines, which is the Mediterranean, and from the desert to the river, that is the river Euphrates. For I will, there's the promise, deliver the inhabitants, there's the prophecy. I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare. All right, now there's the promises and the prophecies spoken by God himself. All right, now let's just go ahead a little ways to Numbers. Numbers, chapter 13. Now God is ready to bring the prophecy into fulfillment. He's got them at the gateway to Canaan, Kadesh Barnea. Everything is ready. They've now got the tabernacle. They've got the priesthood. Everything is ready for the nation to go in and enjoy the Sabbath rest. It would be light work. It would be tremendous production. It would literally be almost heaven on earth. That's the promise. And now the prophecy is ready to unfold. Now come in to chapter 13. And uh, let's just drop in at verse 27. And I've always made the point, you know, that sending in the spies were not God's idea. That was Israel's. God said, go in and take it. But Israel said, oh, let's send spies. Well, that was their first step down in unbelief. But God permits it. You know, God has a directive will, I think, and he has a permissive will. Sad to say, most of us end up in the permissive. But the directive will was, go on in. The permissive will was, okay, send in your spies. So here they come. And they told him, verse 27, and they said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. You all have seen pictures of them carrying the, the grapes and so forth. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled, very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, a, a, gen, a, a giant type people. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. Well, that didn't surprise God. He knew where they were, and he told the Jews that he'd drive them out. Now, verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But, but, the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched to the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants. What a, what a falsehood. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came from the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. What are they forgetting? The promises of God. They are spurning the Word of God. Now, when you spurn the Word of God, what are you guilty of? Unbelief. Unbelief. All right, next chapter, just for a little bit, and then we're going to go on up. And so verse 1, all the congregation, the whole nation of Israel, 
lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt! Would God that we had died in the wilderness! Wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? What have they forgotten? What God said? Unbelief. Unbelief. And this experience of unbelief is referred to all the way up through Scripture. I think it's probably referred to as often as any one thing that I can think of. But we'll jump all the way up to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 3. The horrors of unbelief. And what makes it so horrific is that when mankind says, I don't believe what God said, they're calling him a liar. The righteous, holy majesty of the Godhead that cannot lie, and mankind has the veracity to say, you lied. No, God can't lie. God meant it when he said, I'll drive them out with hornets. They wouldn't have lost a drop of blood. They could have had that, that tremendous land of production if they would have just gone in taking God at his word by faith. But instead, unbelief. All right, Hebrews chapter 3. This is one of the final places that this is referred to. Hebrews chapter 3. Drop down, honey, at uh, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 3, we'll start at verse 8. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, that's at Kadesh Barnea, in the day of testing in the wilderness, when your fathers, now remember Hebrews is written to Hebrews, so this is a reference to Israel, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works for 40 years, in other words, as a result of their turning away from Canaan, they went back into the wilderness, you remember, for 40 years until they all died like flies. Wherefore, verse 10, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. They couldn't believe what he said. So God says, I swear in my wrath because of their unbelief. They shall not enter into my rest. If they can't believe me, they're not going to enjoy the fruits of 400 years of preparation. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief. The most vile sin, I think, that a man can commit against our holy creator God, to call him a liar. And that's what we do when we don't believe. All right, read on. Verse 12 again. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And that's the masses. They refuse to believe what God has said. Now verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, while you still have this opportunity, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ. <laughs> If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. All right, now verse 17, but with whom was he, that is God, whom was he grieved those 40 years while they died in result of their unbelief? Was it not with them who had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Now I have to stop a minute. 
What horrible thing took place in Israel's history, probably a matter of weeks before Kadesh Barnea? The golden calf. The golden calf. And it wasn't just the golden calf, it was their behavior. What did they do? They went into gross pagan religious rites, including all the immorality that was associated with it. And yes, God, I think, put to death something like 21 or 22,000 of them in judgment. But nevertheless, the nation as a whole survived all that. And they come up to Kadesh Barnea. But God isn't talking about the golden calf and the horrors around it. What's he talking about? That they couldn't believe to go in and take Canaan. Isn't that something? Now, I can understand where, where he would have a controversy with the people over their, their laxness and their immorality and their going back into pagan worship of a golden calf. But no, God's put that behind them. He's not bringing that up to them. That's gone. But now what are they guilty of? Pure unbelief. I don't care, God, if you did say it. We can't do it. All right, then the last verse says it all, verse 18 and 19. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, which was the promised land, but to them that committed adultery, to them that worshiped the calf, to them that did this or that or other? No. To them that what? Believe not. Oh, it's awful. I can't, I can't make it strong enough. That when mankind calls God a liar, he is opening the gates of hell fire. Now that's all there's to it. Amen. That's all there's to it. And it's so simple to believe. Knowing that with God nothing is impossible. But oh, we're all human. We're so prone to unbelief. So then verse 19 says it all. So they could not enter in. That is, to the land of promise, which is, of course, a picture of heaven itself in symbolism. But they couldn't get in because of what? Unbelief. And so it will ever be. You cannot attain eternal life, anything short of faith and faith alone. All right? Now let's come back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5 again, now verse 11. And this is the record. Back to 1 John, chapter 5, verse 11. This is the record set in stone that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Now, as I was preparing for this the last few days, I've been trying to find how, for comparison's sake, Paul refers to this whole idea that when we're saved by grace, we too step into an eternal life existence. In other words, we will never, never die. Well, I can't find the exact language as it is here in John's little epistle, but certainly we have all of the symbolic statements that tell us the same thing from Paul's epistles. I'm going to bring you back a moment to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Just like I told you several weeks ago, Paul never uses the term born again. He just does not say born again in so many words. But the implication is that when we're saved, we have a new birth. We are born from above, as he says in, uh, here in Romans 8. And we become the children of God by virtue of a new birth, but he doesn't use the exact name. Well, the same way with eternal life. I can't find where Paul says that we step into eternal life. But look at all these references that mean the same thing. Romans chapter 8. Let's just jump in at verse uh, 16, honey. Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are, not hope to be, we are the children, or here's the term, the born ones of God. That's what the Greek really means. 
that we are the born ones of God. We're born from above. Verse 17, now if we're children, if we're born from above, we're heirs. We're heirs of God and we're joint heirs with Christ. So be that we suffer with him that we may be glorified together. Now verse 18, what a promise from the pen of the Apostle Paul for us grace age believers. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time, now you want to remember there was far more persecution in Paul's day than what you and I can imagine here in America. Now there are other areas of the world, of course, they know what he's talking about. But so far we've been blessed in America that we've been avoiding persecution. All right, so Paul says that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the what? The glory that shall be revealed to us. The glory that's awaiting us. And then he goes on to give us the picture of what's going to take place when we finally receive our new resurrected body. All right, now let's stay in Romans chapter 8 and come on over to verse 35. I'm going to start time just about gone. Now we've got to hurry. Romans chapter 8. Dump down to verse 35. Now remember what I'm trying to say, that Paul is showing us, without saying it just like John did, that we have eternal life. Yet we do. All right, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. The world thinks nothing of us. You know that. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing. Nothing. Height, nor depth, nor any other of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are secure for all eternity. We're in Christ. Now, if I had time, I wanted to go to Colossians chapter 3, where he says we're what? We're hid in Christ, in God. Who can touch us? Nobody. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.